What happens when your borderline girlfriend hoovers you? You think it's because she's woken up and it means that she realizes that she loves you, that you really were the good person. I love you, daddy. I was a bad girl. Take me back, she says. What is really going on with the hoovering? I'm here to tell you that hoovering is nothing like what you think it is. It is not even, whatever you think hoovering is, you are in another parallel universe. It's not anything like you think. Here's the reality. If your relationship with your borderline has gotten to the point where you have been hoovered at least once, your relationship is over. Now, it may, the, the relationship may last. You might even get married. You might even have kids. But I'm here to tell you that the relationship is over. In her mind, it ended. So let me explain to you what is going on with the hoovering. All right, so first, in order to do that, uh, I've got, uh, let me tell you, I've got my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend. I tell you exactly what you need to do to heal from the pain. I'm going to explain to you how this creates a pain in you that will never go away. I don't care how healthy you were before. I don't care if you haven't seen your borderline in 10 years. What happens to you inside the borderline relationship creates a pain, a reoccurring traumatizing pain that never goes away. No matter how long you're away from them, I tell you exactly how to heal it on, in this book. I also tell you how to do it on this channel. You can go to audiobooks.thunderwizard.com to see all of my books. All right. All right, so uh, what happens during the hoovering? First, we have to talk, in order to understand hoovering, we have to understand what the relationship is. So here's who you're with. If you have fallen in love with a borderline, this is what's going on inside the mind of a borderline. You know, they really need to change the name from borderline. You know, there is there people make this huge distinction between BPD and NPD. And the truth is there is no distinction. They are two sides of the same coin. Watch my video about the difference between NPD and BPD. There isn't a difference. The other thing that drives me crazy is when people uh, leave comments on the channel and say, yeah, I had a borderline and I think she had some narcissistic traits. I mean, that's like saying, I had a borderline who had borderline. I mean, it, borderline personality disorder is a form of narcissistic personality disorder. If you can get that through your thick, borderline-loving skull, it'll save you a lot of pain later. I know you won't, though, because that's the nature of the borderline. They don't look like a narcissist on the surface. And they act differently enough that you think that there's a difference. But the only difference is that the narcissist, and you say, like me, I say, well, I wouldn't, I don't date a narcissist. I can see them coming a mile away, which I can. If they're just pure NPD, I can see them coming a mile away. They won't get anywhere near me. But if you understand what the narcissist does and then apply it to the borderline, you'll see that you're just as screwed. So the, and not in the good way. So the narcissist has, is an extremely traumatized infant that is so horrifically traumatized, if they were to feel their pain for one moment, it could literally kill them. So they create a false self and a fantasy world. The false self is a godlike creature that they pretend to be, but it's not them. They, they show this godlike creature to the world and they need to keep that godlike creature worshipped or at least tell themselves they're being worshipped by everybody because if that godlike creature falls apart, the only thing is left is the devil within them and it will kill them. They hate themselves. They can't tolerate themselves. They have no identity. They live in a horrific black hole hell. That's what their fantasy is about. Now, they have an internalized fantasy where they are God and they are worshipped. They have a script written out. They have costumes. They have sets. They have everything all set up inside their fantasy, but they're missing actors. I used to be an actor. So an actor isn't a person. An actor is somebody you show up and you, full, you live inside of a character. 
The better actors are the people who can throw their identity away and merge with the identity of the actor in the play or the movie. Um, so what the narcissist does is grab stick figures in three, in three, uh, in the third dimension, actual physical reality. They don't, they don't have, they, they're not real people to them. They're just actors. They're just stick figures. They're action figures. They grab the action figure and they create a shared fantasy. Now the love bombing that the narcissist does is they're telling you what your role is in the play. And as an actor, actors love taking on new roles. And so it's kind of like, you know, as an actor, you're, you're, you really, except it's conscious, you're taking on the shared fantasy of the writer and the director. So the narcissist is the writer, the director, the producer, and the love bombing is them giving you their fantasy of what perfect reality is. And your job is to put on the costume, read the script, say your lines, hit your mark, and in their mind, if you do that perfectly, then the narcissist will feel okay. And if they feel okay, then as the beneficent God, they will, they will give a beneficent reign and they will make you happy and they will control everything and they will provide all of your needs. Of course, it doesn't work. So what does the narcissist do? The narcissist, dis narcissist discards the actor. The character they've written is still the same, but the actor gets discarded. And they look for another actor who can play the part better. That's all they're doing. You mean nothing to them. Now, I've just described that and you say, yeah, but I'm dating a borderline. No, you're dating uh, a passive narcissist. The borderline has an internal fantasy of perfection as well. In her fantasy, however, she doesn't play the role of director and producer. She doesn't even play the role of the actor. She plays the role of the audience member. And what she wants to do is she has the perfect, the perfect play. And you are the stick figure and she wants to watch it. But instead of pulling you into her internal fantasy, she barfs out her fantasy onto 3D reality. And like an artist begins to paint the sets and the costumes and the lighting and all of that. And your job is to show up and perform for her. And if you perform for her, she will clap. She will watch the show and the emotions that are generated from the show will bring her peace and she will cry and she will be so happy and she will throw roses at your feet. So do you see the difference? One is an internal fantasy, one is an external fantasy, but the same thing is in both is that one, each of them is looking for a stick figure to play a part that they've written for them. So with the borderline, if you're being hoovered, it means that you didn't, you, you uh, failed the audition. Everybody, by the way, fails the audition. The audition is the love bombing. Now, when you get love bombed, here's what happens. If you can understand this, you will understand why it can never work with a borderline. You think you're special. I guarantee you, you're not. You're not special. Not to her. You are special. Don't get me wrong. You're special and unique and beautiful, but not to her. If she has per borderline personality disorder, you are an actor. You are a stick figure. And uh, what happens is in the beginning, she's going to invest in you. So she's sort of like the... Um, the playhouse owner and producer, and she wants to put on a play. She has a dream for this perfect play. And if she can put on this perfect play and get everybody to play their part and have the lighting right and everything and all that, then she will finally be happy because she will be part of this beautiful piece of art that will, will, will shower her with all kinds of feelings and she will be regulated. Her dysregulation will go away. You are the lead character. You are the, the leading man in her play. And what she wants, she's going to invest in you. So she's going to invest in you to create, again, the shared fantasy, which is you realizing what the play is and what your part is, and you choose to throw your identity away in favor of that in order for the praise and the flowers and the applause and 
you know, whatever. Um, so she invests in you with the love bombing. Now you completely misinterpret what the love bombing is. You completely misinterpret it as any sane person would. Because a normal person, if they treated you that way, it would mean that they loved you. It would mean that they loved you unconditionally and they loved you for who you were. And they were just expressing that and they just wanted you in their life and they were going to be there for you. They were showing you what they were going to be like. That's what you think is happening. What you think is happening is that she's showing you what she's going to be like. She's not doing that. She is investing in you. Now, she's not lying. On a conscious level, she thinks she's in love with you. She thinks she's being kind to you. But the truth is, is that she's investing in you. Unconsciously, she's seducing you into the shared fantasy. So what ends up happening on your end is that you, it's like you've won the lottery. I want you to think, I'm, I'm being, I want you to take this as literal as possible. What happens one day you look at, you have a lottery ticket, you just won $5 million. You didn't do anything. You just happened to have the ticket. You, you didn't even buy it. You found it. You found it on the street. Is this yours? Is this yours? No. I guess it's mine. Oh my God, I won a million dollars. I didn't do anything. This is what the love bombing is. You think that you've struck it rich and that it won't cost you anything. You think that you found somebody who's going to love you the way she's loving you now. She's going to keep loving you. She tells you that. And you're actually getting this payoff. She is, she is investing a huge amount of energy. The truth is, She's investing all of her spare energy because her life is on the line. And if she doesn't get this play up and running, she's going to die. That's what it feels like to her. So she's found the perfect actor and she is going to heap praise upon him and give him the script. And she's going to give him, you know, all the stuff that they give you. But it is an investment, and she's going to want to return on that investment. The theater owner, if that play doesn't make a profit, is going to be in big trouble. So a play, a theater, I used to, I used to uh, co-own a theater company, so I know what goes on here. If you own a theater company, you've got to pay rent, you've got to pay whoever else you're paying, designers, actors, everything else. Lighting, electricity, uh, advertising, all, all that stuff. You got you 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 have to invest in the production, and if the production flops, you you have to eat all of that. If you've done it on credit, if you've got investors who have invested in it, you now owe them money. You're screwed. This is what's happening. The borderline is taking all of her energy and she doesn't have any so she has to get it on credit so she has to borrow it and she takes all of this emotional energy and she puts it on you in the form of a love bomb and you think you've won the lottery you think it's free but it's not she's investing in you now in her mind she's happy to do it because you're the perfect uh actor that's going to bring in the audience and everything's going to be perfect. And she's not only going to be happy, she's going to be rich. So she's more than happy because she believes that you're going to pull off this great, you know, uh, this great production. But it never works out. So what ends up happening? She then will start to extract from you. So what happens? The love bombing stops. The love bombing stops because you did not deliver. The play doesn't deliver. She's mad at herself. I invested in this play. It's not working. I invested in this guy. Once again, I thought he was the one. He's not. I've, I, she doesn't have any more energy left. No matter how much love you give her, because now you're giving her tons of love, it's just, it's like she's got opening night, but she needs to have a full house every night for a month and the house is only filling up like you know 20 seats and it's a you know a thousand seat house she's losing money every night that she shows up to this performance she tries to keep it going but she's losing energy every time so your love is supposed to be the house being filled with a thousand people but your love is only 20 people 
and she's furious at you because you, she can see that you're loving her, but it's not doing the job. Then she says to herself, he's the wrong actor. I picked the wrong actor. So then she starts to take from you. So you start to find out that your job as the person who was supposed to regulate her emotions, she is now taking from you what she's invested in. You find yourself having less and less feelings of comfort. You, you feel you're walking on eggshells all the time. You, you don't have any self-esteem. You feel unhappy. You don't sleep well. No matter what happens, you no matter what she says, even if she tells you everything's going to be okay, you feel everything is horrible, you want to die, she starts acting out, she starts devaluing you, she starts splitting on you, and then you start to back away. As the actor, you're like, hey man, you hired me for this gig, I'm doing my job, I'm showing up here every night, I'm putting on the makeup, I'm putting on the costume, I'm hitting my mark, I'm saying my lines, I'm doing it better every night, I'm getting better and better at this thing, and you have no reason to be upset at me, I'm doing exactly what you asked me to do. You told me that if I did this, you would love me forever. Why are you treating me this way? No, you didn't do what I told you to do. I didn't tell you to, to play that part. I told you to play that part and two other parts. You didn't play those two other parts. That's not in the contract. I'm looking at the contract. I'm only here to play one part. You didn't say I was supposed to play three parts. Did I say three? You're supposed to play five parts. You didn't do that. And I, I remember it was a verbal contract and I remember... And now you're in this phase that, that you're committed, you've signed a contract, the love bombing created a, a contract where you're in this thing for life. You know that if you walk away, you'll never get that initial love bombing back. As an actor, I know how fun it is to play parts. I hate walking away from parts. I don't like quitting. I, I hate to, I've, had to, I've had to quit a couple of gigs as an actor. It's horrible. Nobody wants to do that. You fall in love with that part. So that's, the, that's what happens there. Now, when the hoovering comes, is after all of this chaos comes, then what ends up happening is she says to herself, all right, here's what I need to do. I need to go take out another million dollar loan. I need to find myself another lead actor. I got to keep this production going because if I don't keep the doors open to the playhouse, then I'm going to be, you know, the, the investors are going to, you know, take me to the cleaners and I'll be homeless. So I'm going to keep telling them that the show's going on. Translation. She's going to keep telling you, no, we'll work this out. No, I'm still here with you. And, and the moment you're not looking, she's auditioning other actors. She's, hoover, she's hoovering. In fact, she's not only auditioning other actors. If she's lucky, she's auditioning new actors. But more than likely, what she's doing is she is calling up the other five guys that she had cast as this part and fired. You remember now that when you went in for the audition, she was saying, yeah, I've got a guy playing the part now, but you know he's not going to work out. Um, he, he hasn't followed the the script or you know the contract and so he's going to be I'm just letting you know he's going to be fired uh before the next and, and I need an actor now can you do this and and learn the part in you know one night and you know here's your love bombing here's your first thousand dollars can you do it oh heck yeah I can do it well the other guy didn't know that he showed up and she said no you're fired I've got somebody else to do the part now, and he's off now, and he's off, and he's off uh, auditioning for other plays, or he's decided he's going to quit acting altogether, and lo and behold, she calls him up and says, hey, you know what? I made a mistake. Uh, this new guy isn't working out at all. You really were best for the part. I didn't realize it. Now, that's when you're being hoovered. When you're being hoovered, you hear that. Listen, I realize now that you actually were the best person for this play. And now that I've had time to think about it and I tried out other actors, I realize you're the one and I made a big mistake. Can you come back? Uh, I'll, I'll Listen, I'll pay you double. Can you come back and play the part? You think that she's fallen in love with you again. She tells you. 
I realized, in fact, my borderline said this to me. She said, you know, I realize now that was silly what I did. And it was silly. This is the, the thing that's really crazy about it. You know, she, the first time she discarded me, she literally said, after a, a night of lovemaking and, and pillow talk and fantasizing about how we're going to change the world and we love each other, literally the next morning she says, I had a bad dream about you and I don't feel safe. So unfortunately, I can't have any contact with you. Click. It was just absolutely, totally bonkers, crazy, silly. Two weeks later, she called me back and said, you know what, that was silly of me. I realize now looking back on it that you were nice to me. You were good to me. You really are the best person for me. I want to get back together. And I believed it. Looking back on it now, I mean, what a ridiculous thing. She didn't say anything about, you know, I've realized that I didn't do my part and um, I want to be there for you. She didn't, say, she didn't say that. She said, I realize now that you were doing what I wanted all along. I just didn't realize it. So I want to get back together with you, i.e. I want you to keep doing what I want you to do. Nothing about what she's going to do for me. Nothing about how she's going to do her part in the relationship. Um, while I was with her, she, you know, you know, after after discard and Hoover, you know, number two or number three, I can't remember which. She did what she does a lot, talks about ex-boyfriends and how narcissistic they were and abusive they were. And she then talked about one that she had talked very badly about and started saying, you know, I feel bad for him. I'm like, why do you feel bad for him? You told me he was really horrible. She said, yeah, but you know, I think he really loved me. <laughs> you know, no awareness of, of I totally discarded and destroyed and hurt this guy. None of that. Just she's sad because she realized that he actually did love her. And now she's she's thinking, I think he was a better, I didn't realize it at the time. Um, she was thinking, I think he might be a better actor for the part that you're playing. Now that I think about it, he might be better at the part than you. So by the time that you're being hoovered, it means that you failed the audition. And so now we bring in repetition compulsion. I'm a surfer. Um, Jerry Lopez, one of the most famous surfers of all time. If you know anything about surfing, you know who Jerry Lopez is from the 70s, the master of the pipeline. Really, really amazing, wonderful guy. And he said, you know, my girlfriend uh, years ago said to me that surfing isn't a sport. It's a disease. And it's true because it's an addiction. It's an absolute addiction. It's, it's a very healthy addiction, a wonderful addiction. I'm glad I have it. Um, keeps me healthy and happy. But surfing is all about repetition compulsion. You, you paddle out. You catch a wave. It's a great wave or maybe not so great of a wave. If it's not a great wave, then you paddle back out and you say the next one's going to be better. If it's a good wave, you go, oh, my God, that wave was great. I'm going to do the same thing, but this next one, I'm going to do this instead. And so you never really get this feeling of, yep, yeah, it's not like you ate a good meal and you're full. You're never full. You always want the next wave. At my age, uh, I don't come in from surfing because I'm done. I come in because I'm tired. And, you know, when I was younger, I would literally stay out in the water for four hours. I would surf for four hours because... You never get enough. And the repetition compulsion, you get a good wave, you have to go back and get another one. If you didn't get a good wave, you're going to go make it work. This is what she's doing. She's created this, this fantasy world. She's painted all of the sets, got the costumes, the lighting. She's got the, the part written. You're the actor. She wants to watch you act. And then she's going to enjoy like watching porn. You're her porn. She's going to watch you act and she's going to get off on it. And when you don't do the job, she gets rid of you and looks for someone else to play that part. Hoover's them, by the way. But when she comes back to Hoover you, it's that that one didn't fit either. It's like she's got this, this, forgive the pun, I don't mean it this way. She's got this hole and she's looking for the perfect thing to fit inside the hole. That one didn't quite fit right. That one, 
No, that one doesn't quite fit right. This one. The actual role that you're playing never changes. She never discards the, the character she's created. You have to understand you will never be the character she created. You think that you will fulfill the part. You'll do it so well that you'll surpass it and she'll choose you over her fantasy. That will never happen. Do I need to repeat that? You think that you are going to take on the role that she's created for you. You will do it so well that you will surpass it. You will be better at that role than the character she created. And then she will replace you with the character. She'll forget about the character and fall in love with you. And that will never happen. You are doomed from the beginning. When you meet a borderline, the love bombing is the first step to the Hoover. The Hoover is the first of many repeated steps to the final discard. At some point, you will no longer have any meat inside. She will be cracking open your bones and sucking out the marrow, trying to get the last bit of emotion out of you that she can feed off of to regulate her dysregulated emotions. And when the only thing that's left of you is a borderline, she will turn you into a borderline. When the only thing that's left of you is a borderline and there's nothing left for you to give, you can't, you've been told, you go up and you perform this part every night on stage. It takes everything out of you. I know I've been there. It's very draining. You, you Everything out of you. And she says, you still didn't do it right. You still didn't do it right. You know, and if you don't get it right, I'm going to find another, uh, I'm going to find somebody else. And then you finally show up and you can't show up. You don't have anything left. You can't even speak your lines. Your voice, you've lost your voice. You've, you, you're, you're, you don't have anything. You, and she will discard you because you've served no, no function, no purpose for her. And at no time during this process, from the audition, the love bombing, to the final discard, at no time during this process, did she ever see you? She never once saw you. It would be as if I, if I were an actor and I took on the, the role, you know, which is fine. I'm happy to do that if I get paid to act. I haven't acted in years, but um, it, would, it would be as if the writer and the director never knew who my actual name was. And that is not uncommon because I'm there to do a job. They're not there. It's a, it's a professional thing. I'm there to show up and do a job. And, if, and they call you. The thing, is the, the, the thing about directors when they're directing you is they don't call you by your name. They call you by your character's name. If your character's name is Horatio, they'll say, and Horatio, I have some notes for you. Horatio, try it this way. Okay, Horatio, that was great. That's what your borderline does. Your borderline never ever saw you not once saw you as a stick figure and said that action figure will, would look really good in the costume I've painted. So hoovering does not mean that she loves you at all. It means that she's in a repetition compulsion. She tried to fit you into the hole. You didn't fit. She got rid of you. She tried another one. And then she decided maybe you did. Maybe you did fit. I want to make sure. Nope. Nope, doesn't fit. Got rid of it. Let's get another one. That one doesn't fit. Let's go back to that same guy again. You, it fits. Damn, how many times are you not going to fit? Why can't you get it together? Next time, two or three guys later, she comes back to you a few months later, tries, doesn't fit. Maybe at first, maybe for the first couple of lines, but no, you'll never be the right actor for her play. Because there is no actor that can ever give her the performance that will ever regulate her emotions won't happen. All right, that's it. I have beat that uh, metaphor to death. So how I survived my borderline girlfriend, the pain that you're experiencing is because you also, that's a whole other subject, but you are also in a repetition compulsion you can't get out of. You're, you're suffering from 
uh, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder will that will never go away. Just because the relationship is ended, I don't care how long you've been away, that that CPTSD will not go away. You can only stop it, stop the pain if you stop that. And that won't be done with therapy alone. I'm telling you from observation and personal experience, the one thing will fix it. I talk about it in my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend. If you don't want to buy the book, put a little bit of effort into the channel. I've got numerous videos where I tell you exactly what to do. Audiobooks.thunderwizard.com uh, or Amazon and Kindle. Uh, and we've also got the solarflash.thunderwizard.com for my other channel. If you're interested in other spiritual stuff, go check that out. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yes, I shall be back. Talk to you soon. I love you, Daddy. I was a bad girl.